So I want to just thank you and the Polish Heritage Museum for inviting me to come be your educational speaker today for Polish Fest. Uh, my name is Beth Gross. I teach at Centura Public Schools. I teach 7th through 12th grade social studies. And um, I just got back from the trip of a lifetime just about a month and two days ago. So it hasn't been that long that I've um, come from Poland. So again, thank you. Um, what I'd like to start off uh, by talking to you about is how did my journey begin? Okay, so... Um, I, um, about a year ago, I was um, following uh, on Twitter um, a, a teacher from Pennsylvania, and I saw him posting all of these really cool pictures from around Poland, and um, I sent him a message, and I'm like, what are you doing? This looks amazing, and he said, well, I'm here with the Yad Vashem in Israel, and Echoes and Reflections, which is a United States Holocaust curriculum material. And I said, how, how can I be part of this? So about um, December-ish, I'm sitting at home. It's a, it's a weather day. It wasn't a snow day. It was just one of those really cold days. And I saw that the opportunity to apply had arisen. And I put in my name to apply. They took 25 teachers from the United States. And I was one of them. So I consider myself very, very blessed to have been given this opportunity. Found out when I got home that the whole trip was paid for by a family from Israel. So extremely, extremely blessed to have had this opportunity and that I get to share it with you today. So thank you so much. Last Sunday um, was the anniversary of the invasion of Poland, the 80th anniversary, um, September 1st. Um, during that time in Poland, if we, if we take a look at the population, and a lot of what I'm going to talk to you today about are the Jewish Poles. And um, on September 1st, there were 3.3 million Jewish Poles living in Poland. Uh, they didn't necessarily identify themselves as being Jewish. Um, they truly saw themselves as being Polish. Um, religion nece wasn't necessarily a priority for them, it, and for some it may have. Um, some may be strict practicers, um, others may be more, more loosely practicing. But by the end of the war in 1945, um, that number was reduced by 90%. There were 3 million Polish Jews um, who perished during this time. So um, that is here what I'm here to talk to you about today. It's a sobering topic. I know we've been all enjoying the great food and the polka music and all this, and um, it is depressing, um, and I'm going to try to bring in um, the hope, because when I left, um, I truly, truly did um, feel some hope when I came home. So um, in this, and I know this is a really hard slide to see, so I'm just going to talk about this. There were 11 million people who perished in the Holocaust. Six million were, were Jews, one and a half million were children, there were Poles, there were um, Soviets, political dissidents, anybody who disagreed with the Nazi ideology, um, mentally handicapped, um, and the list goes on and on. So 11 million is just a staggering number to even comprehend. Um, I kind of want to go back here. Um, if you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., um, the shoes, the pile of shoes, are something that's just very powerful that you, that you see and you cannot help but um, to be affected by that. Um, the shoes at Auschwitz, um, staggering. Um, I, I don't even have a word for how many shoes I saw, but when you look at it, um, you know, um, it's very sobering. So how I, this is my first time that I'm ever telling anybody, I guess, about my experience, and it's taken me the month and two days to really process the whole trip and think about how I can describe it. But if I were to describe it in one word or one sentence, I would say, never before has my heart been so broken, but yet filled at the same time. So I am going to talk to you about the heartbreak that I witnessed, but I hopefully will leave you with some, um, some hope. Okay, so in that pile of shoes, if you focus on one shoe, for example, you begin to, when you see the pile of shoes, you, you think about the 11 million. When you t focus in on one, you think about that one life. 
And that's really what we were encouraged to do on the trip, is to really focus on the individual life of each of the 11 million and giving them a face and a name and telling their story. So, um, you know, everyone who wore these shoes, they, they were a loved one. They, were, they had a family, um, and all of their lives were cut way too short. So what we did through the Yad Vashem and Echoes and Reflections is one of our assignments is that we were assigned a person, and then we were to tell the story of that person's pre-war life, not necessarily focusing on how that person um, perished in the Holocaust, but what kind of life they had prior to um, the, the Germans taking over. So this is my person, uh, meet Richard Frankel. Um, when I first got his name, I Googled him, and I'm sure some of you are thinking right now, this does not look like a Richard to me. Um, I thought the same, and I Googled again, and I got the same picture. I'm like, surely this is a mistake. This little boy is way too pretty to be a little boy. So after about three Google searches, I said, okay, this is, this is Richard, and um, I found out that he was born June 21st, 1940 in Paris. So knowing he was Parisian, um, Richard became Richard to me, and that's really who he is. So um, I want to tell you the story of Richard because he is in my heart. Um, I, feel, I feel very connected to him after telling his story, and I've made it my mission to share his story wherever I go. So um, Richard, Richard, his mother and father um, were both born in Poland, and they came um, to they they left Poland and they and they went to Paris. There in Paris, they met and fell in love, and um, they were um, they were in the textile industry. So think about Paris, the fashion capital of the world. You know, these are people who I found um, lived just blocks from the Seine River, blocks from Notre Dame, Paris. So, you know, I just imagine this very cultured family, and, and they truly did just love each other. And when they got married, they were living by Esther. The father was um, missing, and he, I have an arrow pointing to him. He's the third man from the left at the top, and Esther is the mom. And they lived and um, shared basically an apartment building with um, Esther's family. So in this court hard, courtyard, he would have had aunts, uncles, cousins living there with him and his dearly beloved grandfather. Well, um, what happens is um, Nissen and the brother-in-laws are deported. They are um, taken to a, con a concentration camp outside of Paris called Bon la Double Ronde. And um, how I know that Esther and Nissen loved each other very much is by a postcard that they that they wrote each other. And um, this is a copy of the postcard. But um, you know, just you know. Um, we will live again as we once did in the past, and our life will be more beautiful. I will go for a walk with you and little Richard in the fields, and we will roll in the green veils just as Richard rolls on the floor at home. I guard this idea like a hen guarding its chick. Was not our life very beautiful indeed? So truly a love story between this mother and father. Well, in 1940, um, 40, one. Um, Nissen is deported. Um, 1942 comes along. Richard has his second birthday, and this is his second year birthday present. Does anybody have any idea what it is? It's a letter opener. So you give um, a little two-year-old a letter opener. That's not a typical present that you would buy a two-year-old boy today. You know, toys, trucks, um, cars, those kind of things, and he gets a letter opener. And I think it's just very precious because his father made this. At this camp, this is one of the things their camp was producing. Um, he's able to receive mail. He's able to even receive visitors and vice versa. And this is what he sends his two-year-old son. Meanwhile, just um, seven days after Richard's second birthday, 
um, Esther and Richard are arrested in Paris. And grandfather hears that um, grandfather hears that they're going to be arrested, and he comes down to the courtyard, and he offers. He said, "Please take me instead of little Richard." And um, it's the French police who arrest them, and they laugh and they say, "Oh, we'll be back for you. You'll have your turn." And that's exactly what happened. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the rest of Richard's story in a little bit later, towards the end. Um, but life was just very normal for them living in Paris prior to this. In fact, um, this is Richard, um, his brother Nissen, and these are uncles right here, and um, they even served the French military until um, France was invaded by the Germans, and then they were dismissed from their duties. Okay, so I started off my trip in Warsaw, and um, the capital city, a um, very, very large area, and we started off our tour at a synagogue. And this synagogue is um, called um, the Nozak, the Nozak um, Synagogue. In 1902 is when it was built. Um, there were 30% uh, of the people living in Warsaw were Jews. Um, this is the only remaining synagogue left um, post-World War II. Why would the Germans leave this synagogue untouched and in perfect shape when all other 399 approximately were destroyed? Well, the Germans used it. They were using it for a warehouse. They were using it for deportations. Um, and that's why it is still standing. So it was pretty incredible to think. You know, 30% of Warsaw's population is Jewish, 400 synagogues, places of worship, and this is the only one that survives. Okay, this is um, part of the ghetto wall that is remaining. Um, the, the, the Germans um, ghettoized the city, which they se se separated them into a separate section of the city. So um, I just want to give you this statistic because it is amazing. Um, we have a square area of, oh, let's see. We have about 30% of the population living in an area of, that is about 2.4% of the city area and confined into this area. The Jews were forced to build the wall, and if that wasn't enough, they were forced to pay for the wall. So um, life gets extremely tough. We went to um, a street called Wallachov Street, and this is part of the ghetto. And these are homes that, that Jews would have lived in when they were in the ghetto. And you can see they're kind of an apartment style with courtyards. Um, we're talking about seven to nine families per room. Okay, then, um, as I wish you, that you could see this picture a little better, but where the wall does not stand, there are these little markers on the street, so it gives you a visual of where the ghetto wall once stood. So here you have where the wall would have been. This is the street that would have only been allowed to have been used by the Germans, and um, or even the Poles that were not Jewish, and on the other side is exactly another spot where it would have been marked off. And this is where you can see, I don't know if you can tell here, but this building, there used to be like a, uh, like a walkway where the Jews had to travel because they could not just cross the street because that street was forbidden for them to cross. So they had to go across the, um, the walkway. This, art, um, this metal arch here marks where um, that, the stairs would have been and um, to go across. Now, the Jews living in Warsaw, in the ghetto, they were only receiving about 184 calories a day. So you think about fueling your body and having to walk to get your food rations, it would have been exhausting, um, and to climb and then quite a, quite a weight up at the stairs. Okay, then we went to the Poland Museum, um, which is just um, a museum that... Um, talks about Jewish life in Lynn, Poland, prior to um, World War I, and they have a little memorial for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, on, let's see, 
On April 19th through May 16th in 1943, um, there were Jews who uprose against the Germans and held them off for almost 30 days. This bunker right here is where the last people remaining in the, in the Warsaw um, ghetto uprising, um, the leaders of the movement where they ended up um, committing suicide before they were caught, and this is the symbol of that, um, to, to recognize those who, who fought off the Germans for 30 days. Okay, then we went to the Jewish uh, Museum, or not the museum, the Jewish um, Cemetery in Warsaw, and it was very haunting, as you can see here. Um, they, do, they do not keep um, their their cemeteries maintained like we do today, and I think it's actually quite profound that they don't, uh, because it is very haunting. Um, When we were here um, in the cemetery, we learned that this was the ideal place for smuggling and, and um, black market trading. Because on the other side of the Jewish cemetery was the Christian cemetery. And um, people from the inside of the ghetto could s trade and smuggle with people on the outside. And we were also taken to a place uh, where there was a hole in the ground and this is actually where little children, who were called snatchers, um, would actually go down into that hole and escape um, out of this out of the ghetto walls and bring in food for the people um, of the ghetto. And they would escape through the um, the sewer system. What I learned also that was very interesting is that it wasn't very hard for people to get out of the ghetto. What became the challenge is how are we going to live if we stay outside of the ghetto wall because they would have been um, killed, churned in, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of in and out movement of the ghetto. We also went to, and I don't have a picture because I just couldn't bring myself to take a picture of this, but not far away in the cemetery we went to a mass grave. Um, there weren't any tombstones, it was a blank space. And we didn't really think anything about it until she, the, till our leader said, you know, why aren't there any um, tombstones here? Well, somebody said, well, it's a mass grave. And I was just like blown away. Um, but I, I'm not very good at spatial relationship. But the space, um, they told us there were 80,000 bodies buried in this mass grave. And I just could not even fathom that that could even be possible. So, um, just layered in like layers of lasagna where people were head to toe, um, sometimes graves 25 feet deep with a little layer of dirt in between. Um, it just is very, very profound to see something like that and you can't even you can't even fathom how that is even possible. This is the Umschlotzplatz where the de um, the depot um, where the Jews were, deported to the gas chambers out of the ghetto Warsaw. This says over 300,000 Jews were driven out from the Warsaw ghetto to con concentration and extermination camps throughout Europe. And this is what remains of it today. Okay, the next day we went to Tikochin and Treblinka. Tikochin is just a very quaint little village. Um, it was a village of about 2,100 people before the war, and um, just a very, very Jewish community. And this is one of the synagogues that is left there. And you can kind of see the quaint homes, um, but they were just a very tight-knit community. What I learned from Tikochin is that of the 2,000 Jews that were living here, they were rounded up, and actually it was their mayor who turned in their names. And so it made it very easy to identify who the Jews living in Tikochin were. They rounded them up on the first day. 1,700 were taken to um, the pits in the forest where they were shot. And um, the next day they came back for the other three, roughly 300. Out of the whole town's population of Jews, there were only... 17 who survived. 
and they had heard um, rumblings before that these pits were being dug and that that was their fate, that they, they knew that they had heard that these pits were being dug and there was talks that they were going to be killed. And that's exactly what happened. As they were taken to the forest and uh, the pits were dug and they were shot and went to the pits. And there are three pits here um, in the forest. And um, the one thing about this forest that I will never forget is the trees. And I know that it might be kind of hard to see them, but they were beautiful, beautiful um, Scottish pine trees. And um, at the tops, there was a light breeze and the trees just kind of swayed at the top, almost like they were just almost mourning. It was very, very surreal to be here and to know that this was a whole community um, wiped out in 24, 24 hours. Then we went to Treblinka, and I mean, this was a very heavy day for me. Um, Treblinka, if you don't know anything about Treblinka, it was the most lethal concentration camp in Poland. Um, it was only open for 13 months, and in that 13 months, they killed approximately 700,000 to 900,000 at this camp. What made it so lethal is that when a train came in with um, a their load of quote unquote cargo or their people. Um, they only kept about five people alive, um, basically to do the dirty work of taking care of the dead bodies and, and so on and so forth. But um, it was shut down. Heinrich Himmler came in and he was the mastermind of the final solution. And um, they had been just basically burying the bodies, and he says, "We can't, we can't have this. Uh, we need to, we need to destroy the bodies." And I'll come back here just a second. We need to destroy the bodies. So they basically take these pyres and they they exhume all of the the, the bodies that they have buried, and they start burning them, including. Um, the, the ones that they are currently killing. So in 13 months, almost a million people were murdered. Um, the stones mark, uh, there are 17,000 stones to mark the regions from the world where um, people came in and were murdered here. Um, another thing, again, just a very, very beautiful place, the trees, oh, it was the forest. Um, the Nazis were very, very sneaky about what they did, um, very deceptive. Um, this is out in the middle. Uh, this is northeast Poland, um, out in the middle of nowhere in the forest where people aren't really going to know what was going on. And it was just sickening to learn uh, what happened here at Treblinka. Obviously, the death, but the deception was just horrible. I learned that there was a building that they had painted to make look like a train depot that there was ticket window, windows painted, signs saying, you know, um, this train's arriving at this time, these are departures. There was even a man who would greet the people as they arrived at Treblinka, and he would say, oh, so sorry for your long trip. You must be so tired, we apologize. Um, we're gonna go ahead and let you shower, and we're gonna take care of you. And within two hours, Almost everyone who entered Treblinka was dead. Um, they used carbon monoxide here at Treblinka. But again, um, just a beautiful place in terms of the forest and just horrific to know the tragedy that happened. This monument, um, this monument right here um, on the left marks where, um, marks where um, the crematorium would have stood. Okay. One of the famous um, people that died at Treblinka was Jonas Nor um, Norcek, and um, he actually would have had the opportunity, he was running an orphanage um, in Poland, he had the opportunity to escape and get out, and he said, no, I can't leave these children alone, I'm going to stay with them, and he stayed with them until the very end as they were entering the gas chamber, so there is a um, stone for him and then um, on the outer skirts this is just the memorial in Warsaw because that's where the orphanage was and they were deported to Treblinka but definitely just a very heroic man who, who did good by children 
Okay, then we went to Woj. Um, Woj is the largest ghetto in all of Europe. And um, before we, we actually got into the ghetto, we made a, a stop. And the stop was a memorial called the Righteous Among the Nations. And this is a mor memorial that pays tribute to all of the Polish people who risked their life to save the Jews. And so at this memorial, they have little placards that have um, places for the names of those who have become righteous among nations. Well, how do you become righteous among nations? Well, there's some criteria for that. Um, you can see I had no idea that I was basically standing in a monument that was shaped like the Star of David until I got home. And um, somebody in our group had sent this to us. Um, but we did learn the, the, the qualifications in order to become righteous among the nations. Um, just a little fact, there are 6,992 poles listed among the righteous of the nations. Now, in order to get that, um, I guess, status, you had to risk your life, you had to be non-Jewish, and um, you could have gotten nothing in return no payment, nothing in return for doing that. And plus there had to be documentation proving what you had done. There's a council, and, and this council is still working today to keep adding people to this Righteous Among Nations. Okay, there is an estimation that there are between 30 to 35,000 Jews who were saved by the Poles. So this is just a special place honoring those Polish people who who risked their lives to do the right thing in a time where it would have been very um, dangerous to do so. Okay, so this is just a look on the outside. It's a beautiful monument here. Okay. Okay, then just randomly here, we, are, um, we got to the Stanislav um, Gorchowski. And um, she, our leader, Cheryl, was just standing here talking about this man who was a Pole, and he, he had this family who ended up at his house, and he says, I can take them for two days. I can take you for two days, that's it. Well, two days turned into two months, and two months turned into two years, and every day he carried up two buckets up into the attic, one bucket for waste, the other bucket for food, and he carried it up and down every day. Well, our leader that we were with, her name is Cheryl, and she's from the Yad Vashem. She lives in Tel Aviv, Israel. And she just randomly throws out to us that this man, because of this man, I'm here. He saved my mother. And so we all got goosebumps, and we were like, you know, whoa, Cheryl, you know, like, way to, way to throw that in. But this was a personal connection um, of a, a Polish man who saved... Um, saved the whole family and this lady that gave me the opportunity and shared her knowledge with me um, she wouldn't be here had it not been for Stanislav okay then we went to the site um, in the ghetto where the head of the Judenrat um, his name was Chaim um, Romkowski um, he was he, he very much believed that if he could make the Jews in his in the ghetto working that they would be valuable and that if, if they were working they had value their lives would not be at risk so the germans come to him and say we need twenty thousand um, jews for deportation and uh, we're not going to pick them you pick them uh, which is, seems like a very cruel thing to do and um He's left with the predicament of how am I going to choose 20,000 people from this ghetto to take? Well, his solution is he's going to take the elderly, the sick, and the children. And um, in this spot, he stands and gives this very famous Give Me Your Children speech where he encourages people basically to volunteer um, to be among those who were deported. Now, his life um, ends very tragically. Um, you know, it's a choiceless choice. If he didn't choose 20,000, um, the Nazis probably would have come in and taken 20,000 plus a whole lot more. Um, so he really didn't have a good option. 
but he was doing the very best that he thought he could do by taking people he thought were not able to work and would not have as much value in the ghetto. So what, what ends up happening is when he is finally deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, they say that he was killed before he even barely got off the train by, um, by his own people. Okay, um, I had the opportunity um, to hold some ghetto money uh, made out of trash. Um, they had like an inside market trading inside of um, the ghetto. Um, it was just really very, it was so surprising how light, but this, this was a, an economy where they still were able to trade and do a lot of black market trading. Okay, we, um, we stopped at another synagogue, and then we went to, um, right on the other side of the synagogue was a Jewish cemetery, and again, this is in Woj. And there was a field, uh, just a blank field with little markers. They almost look like, within the tall prairie, they almost look like butterflies floating, um, but each spot marks the place of somebody who perished in the Woj ghetto. And um, every year, the Israeli police or the military come in and um, take care of take care of the cemetery and mark it. What makes this cemetery different than, say, the cemetery in Warsaw is that they buried each person individually versus the mass graves. And there are a total of forty three thousand graves in these fields. When you get to the end of the 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 cemetery, we came across these pits. There were six pits that were dug, and they were left like this. And Cheryl told us the story that the people who were responsible for taking care of the ghetto and burying the dead, um, that they knew the, the Russians were closing in quickly. They asked them to dig these pits, and their plan was to put the people, the remaining people, in the pits. And as luck would have it, um, the Russians flew overhead and the Germans fled, leaving these pits with no one in it. But that was quite um, something to see. Okay, then we went to the Radagosk, which is just a museum that um, has locomotion, uh, locomotive that was would have been used in the Holocaust right here, and as well as cattle, cattle cars. We had the opportunity to go into a cattle car um, it just, I'm going to be quite honest, when I walked in, it almost like was like the air just kind of was sucked right out of you. And I know it's kind of hot, and I don't know if anybody wants to maybe check the air conditioner too, because I think it got shut off. But um, being in there, it was just, it, it just, you could feel how stifling it was. I'm not a tall person at five foot seven. This is a picture of me with my hand up, and I am touching the ceiling of the cow car. So if you're six foot five, um, your head more than likely would have been touching. They put about a hundred people per car um, with about 10 car loads per train trip. Uh, one small window covered in barbed wire, uh, one bucket for waste. There were no stops for water, there was no food. By the time the, the cargo arrived at camp, um, they were they were ready to get off. Um, a lot of times, um, not everybody not everybody made it. Um, at Treblinka, for example, there was one train load that came in from Paris, and basically, when they when they unloaded, it was an unloading of bodies. No surviving people made the trip. So just a horrific horrific event. Okay, then um, after Woj, we went to Krakow. And it, Krakow is a beautiful, beautiful city. Here we um, learned a tale of, um, we stopped in um, Kielce. And what I learned about Kielce is um, after the war, if you thought, think about surviving the Holocaust, what would be your first instinct as a survivor? Well, it would be to try to find your loved ones that you had been separated from. So a lot of people went back to their hometowns looking for survive, their surviving family members to see if they had anybody left. And what ended up happening there um, is a horrible pogrom against the Jews. Um, they were accused of kidnapping a young man, um, a young boy. 
and there was basically a riot and 43 Holocaust survivors were murdered. And this marks where they are buried. And then also in the same cemetery um, is from the Kielce ghetto. This is a grave of 45 children. Okay, um, also in Krakow, um, it's just gorgeous. Um, in the Kashmir district, you can see they've done replications of what that part of Krakow would have looked like back in the time. I know my pictures aren't really doing justice right now, um, but just a beautiful, beautiful city. Okay, um, we also went to um, the spot where they had the ghetto in Krakow. And again, Cheryl did a lot of this where she would bring pictures from the past and she would take us to that exact spot where that had happened so we could see it how it looked today. And this is in the, the memorial here and you can see this building here where Jews would have been rounded up and they would have been deported. Um, this is what the memorial looks like today and this is about the size of the ghetto. It was an incredibly, incredibly small ghetto. Then we went to Oscar Schindler's um, factory, and here we are outside of the gates of his factory. Um, you know, very famous for say, putting Jews to work in his factory and saving them. One interesting thing I learned about Oscar Schindler is that he was not um, originally listed as a righteous among the nations. He did not become righteous among the nations until after um, Schindler's list came out. Okay, and then just, a, um, it's a beautiful memorial too where they have pictures of the Schindler Jews that he put to work. Um, in Krakow, the ghetto wall, if anybody wants to take a guess of what this reminds you of, to me it reminds me of tombstones and that's kind of morbid to think that's how they made the wall to look like tombstones. Okay, um, then our last day we spent at Auschwitz-Birkenau um, the gates into Birkenau, um, the barracks of platform, this is where the cattle car would have stopped and um, the people would have been deported here before they were selected. This is where the selection took place. If you were able to work, you could live. If they didn't think you could work, you were sent immediately to the gas chambers. Um, this is, on the picture on the left is the barracks, inside the barracks, where um, the people would have um, had to have slept. There was maybe two blankets um, per bunk, and um, I think about six to eight per level. <laughs> on the right-hand side, you may be wondering, what in the world is this? Well, this is the latrine, the only one. So on the men's side of camp, there was one building for bathrooms, and on the women's side, there was also one building for bathrooms. And what I learned here is because um, really you only had one chance to use the restroom a day. Um, it, was, it was a very um, unsanitary place, thus the Nazis did not come into this part of camp. Um, and there was a lot of um, sharing of messages, um, trading black market deals because it was a safe place because the Nazis refused to go inside. This is what's left of the main crematorium in, um, in Birkenau. Um, as, as the Russians get closer, um, the Germans start destroying the evidence, including um, the crematoriums. The one thing that really um, I guess really hit home with me when I was on this trip as Cheryl called this um, the greatest robbery in world history and myself being a historian I guess I never really thought of it in that way Jews were encouraged to bring up to 50 kilometer or kilograms of luggage and oftentimes what they did is they brought their most prized possessions and um, once they arrived the the luggage was co collected and it was gone through and sorted. And an area of Birkenau was called Canada, and it was building upon building upon building upon building. Honest to goodness, there was more buildings of Canada than there were of barracks. And that's where they stored um, the prisoners' personal belongings, and trains would be loaded, and the goods would be shipped back to Berlin. 
um, just very, very profound to see that and, and to actually be heard as a reference of the greatest robbery in world history. I would have to totally agree. Then we went to Auschwitz. Um, this is more of where the workers stayed. Birkenau is more for extermination. Um, the barracks here at, at Auschwitz. And you can see um, just, you know, the separation. You know, this would be a pathway for the, the guards to take. Barbed wire, electric fences. Over here on the right um, is a memorial. It's a spot where um, people were executed via firing squad. The other thing that I took away from the trip is the misnomer that I thought most, most victims of the Holocaust were gassed in crematoriums. I learned that was not true. Um, the most common cause of death was probably um, shooting or starvation. Okay, and then we had the opportunity, um, and, and, and just, I can't even describe to you what it's like to walk into the crematorium. Um, there aren't any words to describe it, but on the left is the crematorium at Auschwitz. Um, you can actually see scratch marks on the wall where people would have tried to, to get their way out. Um, this hole in the ceiling is the ceiling, and that's where the Zykon B um, was dropped, and that's how the people were gassed. And then you can see the ovens um, on the right where the bodies would have gone to be cremated. So at Auschwitz-Birkenau, 1.1 million perish here. Okay, so I'm going to come back and wrap things up with Richard. Okay, mom is deported. About after, after Richard, Richard and his mom, Esther, are arrested, They're, they stay a week at a camp called... Um, Oh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but then they're sent to this other camp called Pithers. For about three weeks, they get to spend their last days together, and then Esther is deported to Auschwitz. So dad has already been deported to Auschwitz. Mom has now been deported to Auschwitz. This leaves Richard an orphan, and he has been an orphan for about five weeks. So... Um, I have some unfortunate news to share with you. Um, he was murdered at Auschwitz along with 170 other orphan, 171 other orphans. Um, he is taken um, to Par from Paris to Auschwitz, and I have the aha moment on the trip as we're talking about the steps leading into the gas chamber. That you know the hair was the hair was shaved. The hair was actually used in the war effort by the Germans. But my aha moment where I just wanted to crumble was my realization that when I first got assigned Richard and I thought he was a girl, the realization was the sweet little boy's first haircut would have been upon his arrival to camp. And, and that broke my heart. And then Cheryl shared with me that his parents were Hasidic Jews. And in the Hasidic Judaism religion, a child's hair is not cut until the age of three. So, um, Richard, um, obviously, um, a, a life cut way too short. His birthday was June 21st. Uh, this year, he would have been 79 years old. And I have no doubt that if it wasn't for the Holocaust, he would still be with us today. Um, I had to share Richard's story, right? I didn't have to. I had the extreme privilege, just as I have here today, to share with you his story. But I shared with his story at the remains of crematorium number two. Um, we will never know which uh, crematorium Richard um, was um, murdered in, but this little sweet little boy was orphaned, and I, I just cannot imagine. And as a mother of three of children of my own, it, it makes my heart break. And Esther's heart was broken. And what makes this such a tragic story is she had the opportunity to get this postcard written and out the window of the cow car she was riding in from Paris to Auschwitz. And I just want to read it to you. Friday, 7 August. My dear family. I am on the train. I do not know what has become of my Richard. 
He is living in Pithivers. Save my child, my innocent baby. He must be crying horribly. Our suffering is nothing. Save my Richard, my little darling. I can't write. My heart, my Richard, my soul are far away and no one is protecting my little two-year-old boy to die quickly. Oh, my child, give me my Richard, Esther. So this is just one story of the 11 million. Oops. Okay, now how can something like this happen? This, I'm gonna close things up. How, how do we get to this spot where something like this happens? How do we make sure that this doesn't ever happen again? Well, the best tool that I've ever seen is this pyramid of hate. And at the bottom of the pyramid, we have biased attitudes. Things like scapegoating, blaming others, stereotyping, um, non-inclusive language, insulting remarks. At the next level, we have acts of bias. That would be name-calling, um, using slurs, epitaphs. At the next level is discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination criminal justice discrimination, um, harassment. And at the top, we have um, violence. Things like um, destruction of property, arson, murder, threats. So the powerful lesson is, if we do not stop checking our behaviors here at the biased attitudes, the acts of bias, the discrimination, things rapidly, it becomes okay. If left unchecked here, it makes it very easy to do this. If left unchecked here, it becomes easier to do this, and so on and so forth. So what I'm here to do today is to encourage you to be all upstanders and um, really you know, promote, promote the opposite of hate, acceptance and love and, and stop um, these attitudes and the bias so that we don't ever get to this point again. So the hope that I leave you with today and that I left with is the beauty of where I was and then also the people that I met along the trip. And this is Cheryl, she's our fearless leader. Again, she's the daughter of a Holocaust survivor um, she imparted her knowledge with us, and I'm truly grateful for her. And then while we were at Birkenau, we had a very, um, I would call it a twist of fate, a divine intervention. We had Harold join our group. There, We were a group of 25 teachers from America, and pretty soon we were presenting our stories of our people that we, we had researched and studied, and pretty soon this man comes and sits down with us, and he says, may I join your group? And we said, yes, please do. And he introduces himself as Harold. He is a math teacher in Hamburg, Germany. Cheryl says, you can join our group, but we are going to expect you to contribute some way before you leave. So Harold is standing here on the right and he's sharing his story. And he said, I am so grateful that your grandfathers stopped my grandfathers from doing something horrible. It turns out both of his grandfathers were Nazi SS, the worst kind of a Nazi soldier there was. And he said, I'm trying to learn to that their past doesn't make it my past and I can move forward. And just meeting Harold, joining our group, it was such a blessing to meet him. And at the end of the trip, Cheryl and Harold hugged and um, it was just very profound to watch a daughter of a Holocaust survivor um, offer forgiveness um, and love to the, the grandson of a Nazi SS. And then this is my group of 25 colleagues. I'm, I'm very serious when I say there is not a day that has gone by in the one month and two days since I've been in Poland where I have not talked to one of these guys. I feel forever bonded with these people. I've received text messages and messages today. You know, Beth, you're going to do great. Um, these, these are my friends. We, we shared an, an incredibly amazing experience together. 
and we're part of the puzzle. And by me sharing with you today, I'm hoping that you will be a piece of that puzzle to bear witness and, and stop the hate in this world so that we have a better place for our future to live. And then this is just a picture of Cheryl. And then last but not least, but I get the opportunity to share Richard's story. Richard is at school with me this year, his little picture. This is um, in my classroom. Um, I, I would like to think this is the first time Richard's been to school. Um, and I get to share his story and I will continue to share his story until, um, until the day I die. But um, he truly is, I feel like he is my adopted son. So that is all I have for you. Is there any questions? I thank you for bearing with us. I think our air conditioner got shut off. I know it's hot and stuffy in here, but I just I want to thank you for the opportunity to getting to speak with you today at Polish Fest. Thank you very much. Was it in Auschwitz? Auschwitz. Okay. <coughs> it was in Auschwitz. And not only that, but not hair, but glasses, um, and, you know, like, uh, like prosthesis, prosthesis um, oh, yeah. just everything. Combs, razors. Yeah, I'm going to ask her something. Thank you.